Greetings everyone and welcome back to Ashes. My name is Phoenix. If you are new here and begin to enjoy what you are hearing, please hit that subscribe button and don't forget to set your notification bell to all that way you'll know every time I upload a video. If you'd like to learn how to become a member, all of that information can be found down below. Without further ado, it is time to go back to Ashes. For once we arise from the ashes, we are a bigger, brighter, stronger, and a happier person every day. Sit back, relax, kick back, grab a snack, or tuck in and get warm, and prepare for your dose of vocal melatonin entitled, True Creepy Let's Not Encounters. Right after this intro, there will be an ad. I'll read the first story, there will be an ad. And after that, there will be no more ads within this video. Disclaimer, this video is for educational and entertainment purposes. We were at a sportsman warehouse in Colorado with our parents. I was 14, and my little brother was 12. We were on a trip to see family, so we were about done walking around and decided to sit down in the camping chair aisle while we were waiting for our parents to be done shopping. While we were sitting there, a lady that looked cracked up on some sort of drug walked up to us and started asking very weird questions. She asked us, Where's the Colorado River? Can you show me on the map in the front where the Colorado River is? There was a map of the U.S. in the front of the store, right by the entrance. She kept telling us to walk up there with her because she needed help finding the Colorado River on it. We both were rooted out and started to walk and find our parents. She kept following us and didn't stop. We found our parents and I told them what happened. My mom started to yell at the lady, but she wasn't going away even after all of that. We checked out and started leaving the store. When we walked out, we saw the creepy lady and three or four men run out of the store and near a van that was hidden out of the camera's view. Two of the men were waiting outside of the store, and that's when I realized what was happening. The lady wanted my little brother to go to the front of the store so the two men could abduct him and run to the van. I am so glad I followed our instincts and didn't follow the lady. To this day, I am very cautious when I go into town, especially because I live on the border of Mexico and Arizona. Don't talk to strangers, even if you are an adult. You never know how many people are in on the abduction. In my 20s, I got the opportunity to do a paid college internship at a very popular theme park in Florida. I worked day and night shift at a resort where I met this man in his 40s who I'll call D. D was a day shift short order fry cook and mostly worked in the quick service burger area and soup and sandwich area. Most people my age weren't very nice to him because he wasn't considered attractive and he was very overweight. However, I was raised to respect everyone, especially those older, so I was always kind to him and made conversation. I would even eat with him on certain occasions when our lunch breaks were at the same time. D opened up to me about his life. He said he was having some financial and health issues. He also told me about his ex that had been physically and emotionally abusive towards him. I told him that he deserved better and that I hoped he would find someone special one day. We continued being friendly and joking with each other daily. During that time, everyone was getting work wives and work husbands. It was a joke and something to do because honestly, the job was busy but boring. We found ways to entertain ourselves. Dee and I became work husband and wife, which didn't consist of anything different than what we were already doing as work friends. I also had two other work husbands. One was even gay. <laughs> so one day I came to work to everyone laughing and looking at me. I asked what was up and my friends jokingly said, Congratulations on your new boyfriend. 
I was confused and I was like, what? I, I don't have a new boyfriend. They explained that they knew that already, but D had been going around telling everyone we were in a relationship. They found it funny, but I did not. I confronted D about it, and he said that he had said it. I asked him why, and he said he wanted us to be in a real relationship. I was taken aback because he was 20 years my senior, and I thought he understood we were just friends. I told him this, and he said that he had fallen in love with me. I told D that we had only known each other a few months, and that I was kind to him, and he confused that with something more. I told him that he didn't love me. He insisted he did so. I just walked away. The next day, his friend C came to me and said D had been crying to her about me. She said he had confessed to her that he loved me so much. She asked me to talk to him because he was devastated. I told her I didn't feel the same way, and I had already spoken with him. This went on for a few days, and he continued telling people we were together while crying to see about me. I confronted him again, angrily, and told him to stop lying about this supposed relationship. He apologized. I also confronted my friends about joking as it was not funny to me and was making the situation worse. It had even made it to management for crying out loud. I stopped talking to D after that and kept my distance. The following week, I was working in the pizza shop with my friend P. We played a lot with one another. He delivered pizzas to the guest in the resort, and we were discussing that when he brushed something off my shirt. D saw this as he was walking through. He stood there staring for an uncomfortable amount of time in silence before walking away. Later, after my break, I was moved to a burger with D, and he abruptly started crying and asked if P and I were together. I told him we weren't, but even if we were, it was none of his business. He asked me why I was so suddenly so mean to him, and he loved me so much. He was crying, and I do mean really hard. I was freaked out. I told him to stop saying that. He said it was true and that he would be really good to me. I told him he was making me extremely uncomfortable. He said he would never do anything to hurt me because he loved me too much. I told him that I hadn't gone to management because I understand his financial issues and knew he needed this job, but if he continued, I would have no choice. He asked me to and said that he really meant what he said about loving me. He started crying harder. I told him he and I would never happen. His face turned really red and he looked at me. He was crying extremely hard and screamed out, I'll fucking kill myself. I can't have you. I hate blackmail. I hate people trying to force me to do things I don't want to do. This pissed me off. And I told him that what he was saying was manipulative and would not work out on me. He had crossed a line, and all that communication between us was now terminated. I left out and spoke with a the coordinator. They are the people right under management. The managers were in a meeting at the time. D and I never worked together again, though C said he was still devastated. I was moved exclusively to night shift, and on few occasions, when I was needed on day shift. It was on days he didn't work. That was just one of the most uncomfortable and freaky work experiences I've ever had. So, D, I hope we never meet again.
At the time I'm writing this, the story had happened to me about five days ago. It was on a Saturday, and for context, I am a 16-year-old French boy, so I apologize in advance if my grammar is off and I make a lot of mistakes. So, I was with my friend this Saturday in my little French hometown, casually hanging out at the border of the town for an entire hour. My friend here is a 17-year-old girl. We were sitting on the big rocks behind the kindergarten school of our town, right in front of the best field at around 8 p.m. The sky was starting to turn dark. Nothing has ever happened in our town since we lived in it, except recently when a dad stabbed his daughter and wife 40 times, but it has nothing to do with my story. Note that there aren't many foreigners there since it's kind of a lost country town close to Paris. So, I was sitting with my friend eating stuff like we casually do when we hang out when suddenly I spotted a man with a beanie. He had his hands in his sweatshirt and was directly walking towards us. He was way too close to my friend and me to get up and walk away. He comes right in front of us and starts talking English. My friend doesn't speak English, so she didn't really know what was happening at the time. So, this guy comes right in front of me when he noticed that I was able to speak English and tries to shake my hand, which I deny the approach. Note that he didn't look like he was drunk or under drugs. The weird guy starts talking to me and he points out to the field that was behind my back, which seems that if I wanted to look at it, I would have needed to turn my back to him. And then he says very insistent, is that cabbage? I responded yes, but he wasn't satisfied by my response since he was trying to get me to look behind him. However, there was literally the other part of the field that was in my line of sight at my left. He tried to get me to look again and again, which was kind of stressing me out because this guy was at like less than a meter away from me, which means that he could have done anything he wanted to me. Then he told me some incoherent stuff like, my driver told me there was some cabbage. Or I asked people, they didn't understand. Right after saying that, he pets my shoulder goes behind me and crouches at the border of the field. He tells me to come see it and asks me if it was cabbage when I clearly told him many times that it was cabbage. Even though it was not, I was just trying to get rid of this creep, but it kind of looked like cabbage. Right when I see that, I'm out of his range. I say to my friend to take her bag and start running. At first she thought I was joking, but when she saw me running, she changed her mind. We were like 20 minutes away from him, and he started walking towards us, but rapidly disappeared behind the kindergarten school. My friend and I were both really unsettled and quickly wanted to go home. We said goodbye to each other, and we split it in two directions. I needed to go by the elementary school that was right next to the kindergarten school to get home. Suddenly, I see the creep coming from the road that was between the field and the kindergarten school with his phone on and in his hands. I quickly turned around and went at my friend's house with her, waiting for her father to drive me home. Later that night, my friend and I were talking and we suggested that it may be some sort of kidnapping or organs trafficking stuff since it was the first time we saw and a lone foreigner that didn't speak a single word in French. The fact that he got up and escaped quickly when we started running hinted me on the fact that it was just some pretext to get me to move away from my friend. Maybe he had texted some guy waiting in a car for them to kidnap my friend or me, since the creep was clearly trying to make us lose time with his cabbage freaky story thing. Later that night, I 
told what happened to a friend that lives in the same town as us, and he told us that this guy was hanging around the town with a weird behavior that day. We were really unsettled and scared after that event, but now we're completely good, and I'm wondering if we're doing too much about that guy, even though my intention really told me to get the hell away from him. If anyone has anything to say to help us clear this, if it looks like some already known cases that already happened to someone, please let us know. To the creep that made me feel like I was trapped in a horror story, let's never, ever meet again. Hello everyone, I need some advice on what to do to this rather strange situation that I'm in. Last night, after a party, a guy who was a friend of a friend offered to drop me off at home. I was hesitant and wanted to book an Uber, but he insisted on driving me. The problem was, I was feeling quite drunk and out of sorts. When we got to the parking lot, he sat in the car with me, turned off the lights, and said he'd wait for a few minutes since he was feeling a little high, too. I got scared and said I would go out and wait, but he convinced me not to and even discouraged me from booking an Uber. Things took a weird turn when he started driving in the wrong direction, assuming I was too intoxicated to notice, but I wasn't, and I asked him to take the correct turns. He kept taking detours and turning off the GPS, but I managed to use my phone to navigate and get us back on track. During the ride, he started praising me excessively, talking about how other girls in his life weren't good, but I was different. He seemed to be pushing me into something more, even though I have a long-distance boyfriend. It made me rather uncomfortable, and I insisted he take me straight home, right now. After reaching home, I realized he left his ID card in my bag. Now, I want to return it to him, but given the weird behavior during the ride, I'm not sure how to do it safely. I don't want to meet him alone ever again. The common friend has moved to another state. Has anyone been in a similar situation or has any advice on how I can safely return his ID card without putting myself in an uncomfortable or risky position? I thank you in advance. Oh yeah, quick update here. Thank you so much. Super grateful to all of you commenting. I understand how some of you said there was no need to agree with them offering to drop me off. The problem is this happened to me the first time, and I didn't have to be assertive till now. I hadn't been put in that situation before that day, so I didn't really know how to deal with this. I just went with it like I'm dealing with a simple friend. I know this was not the time to be innocent, and I should have known better, but I have taken lesson for life. Oh, yeah, almost forgot that too, about the ID. I did drop it off at a friend's place and ask him to take it from there. He seemed to have realized but wants not to talk about it. He asked me to hang out again. I mentioned that he got a little too drunk that night. I told him the location of his ID and blocked him. However, I don't want to be a part of any drama, so I was not super rude, as I initially thought I would be. I politely told him that this made me uncomfortable, and I don't want to be friends anymore, and blocked him. So, and to that I say, I hope I never see him ever again at anyone's party. This happened about four years back. It was the middle of winter, and the night was unseasonably warm, without a hint of snow on the ground. I left my apartment at around 8 p.m. to go for my daily walk. I worked nights, and my schedule was screwed up, hence the 8 p.m. walk. 
figuring I would walk across the bridge into the city nearby. For further context, I'm a tall guy who's fairly athletic, and I was in my late 20s at the time. I'd rarely had a problem walking at night, and at that time, I felt safe to do so. I put on my headphones and headed towards the bridge. The first 20 minutes were uneventful. I passed by some old houses, a subpar Mexican restaurant, a really good Mexican restaurant, a sketchy-ass gas station, some newly built upscale apartments, and finally, I was at the river, enjoying the view of the bright lights over the dark flowing water, not yet frozen. I crossed the bridge into the city and hit a crosswalk button at a four-way intersection, then noticed someone standing on the corner opposite. The only other soul I'd seen outside that night, actually. Seemingly, she was doing nothing, and I assumed she was waiting for an Uber to come and pick her up since she didn't seem to be waiting for the light to change. The street, ordinarily busy during the daytime, was silent. The light changed and I crossed, headed her direction. As I neared her, I noticed that she would cast glances in my direction, then look away, almost sheepishly. She did this multiple times and I figured she was unnerved by me. I sympathized, figuring it must have made her uneasy, us being the only two people on a dimly lit street. As I passed by, I took in her outfit, mostly because I thought she looked cold. She wore a knitted hat with tassels, a sweater that looked too thin for the winter, tight jeans, and a little plastic children's backpack on her back. I thought she was in her teens at first, but upon closer inspection, she appeared to be in her late twenties or thirties. She had short cropped light brown hair and a pale complexion. She was skinny and was of average height. I was maybe a head taller than her. I walked by and continued down the street. I passed by high-rise hotels on my right and left and made my way into a central park. During peak hours, this place would be packed with tourists and locals alike. But that day, at an odd hour and with the pandemic in full swing, I felt like the only man in the city. I admired the brilliant display of lighted trees as I crossed through the center of the park. Then, figuring I was at a good halfway point in my journey, I made my way around an old marble and stone library back towards the bridge. As I turned the corner of the library back onto the street from which I had come, I nearly collided with someone moving towards me. It was the same woman I'd seen not even ten minutes earlier. My noise-canceling headphones were still on, so I pulled them down to one side and said something by way of apology. She said nothing in return. Instead, she stepped back from me and stood below a streetlight not making eye contact. She stole tiny glances at me, that same tick I'd noticed before. I put my headphones back on, nodded a good night, and headed towards the nearest crosswalk. Reason told me that she must be headed in the direction I'd come from, since we'd nearly run into each other headed opposite ways. But some part of me whispered that she wasn't headed that way. Sure enough, when I turned to look, she was trailing close behind me, her stride surprisingly long and energetic. I found this odd enough that I continued to watch her out of the corner of my eye. Shortly after I reached the crosswalk, as I stood there waiting for the light to change, she caught up with me, passed me by, and stopped. A car went past, and as it did so, she squatted over her plastic bag a few meters from me, rifling frantically for something, looking up at me on occasion. I hit a button on my headphones, stopped my podcast so that I could hear her better. What I found disturbing about the motion of her looking through her bag is that it struck me as fake, as though she were pretending for some reason. 
she was barely looking inside of it, and her careless motions stuck more like bad acting. Something about her motions, the way she kept looking at me, just felt wrong. The light changed, and I began to walk quickly, but she was faster. She stood suddenly, darting past me towards the museum, swinging the half-open little pink backpack over her shoulder. I watched her silhouette disappear into the darkness beyond the reach of the streetlights. I hoped that this was the end of that, and after a few beats of not seeing her, I let my guard fall a little, restarting my podcast. Beyond the museum was a porch, a poorly lit sidewalk, in front of a squat building with mirror-like windows. I wasn't far from the bridge now. As I made my way back there, I turned my head at the reflections of buildings and streetlights in the windows. To my horror, a dark figure sprinted silently towards my reflection, dreamlike. I'm not sure why. Maybe out of sheer confusion, but I turned to meet her as she hurtled something towards me. Perhaps surprised by my sudden turn, she halted mere feet from me, staring. Her eyes were wide and looked frantic, wild. She kept looking at my arms, then back at my face, as though sizing me up. My accidental bluff had worked. And in the darkness, I suppose I must have looked more prepared to fight back than I felt. She gripped something small tightly in one hand, though she held it off to the side, and in the shadow of the building, I couldn't quite see what it was. Seconds dragged as we stood there, staring at one another, immobilized by fear and confusion. I waited for her to make some move, to attempt to use whatever object she had in her hand. Just then, to my enormous relief, a car trundled slowly past. A bit of my strength returned, and over my blaring podcast, I felt more than heard myself shouting at her, What do you want? No reply. I slowly backed away from her, expecting her to move. She just watched me, that same intense look on her face. I took another step back, then another, then another, steadily backing away from her until I felt confident enough to turn around and carefully walk away. As I reached a better lit area, I began to move faster, all the while keeping my eyes trained on her shadowy form. She stood there for some time, statuesque. Then, abruptly, having spontaneously abandoned whatever plan she may have had for me, she turned from me, and without looking for traffic, she crossed the street with long strides and disappeared around the corner of a building. Something about the casual air of it disturbed me. I kept my eyes trained behind me on my walk home, afraid that she would follow me, the bridge was well lit, and I saw no signs of her. Knowing that this was the only way for her to follow me and keep up on foot, I breathed a sigh of relief. I saw no more cars headed from the city. No more pedestrians out walking. Nothing happened after that. I'm not sure why, but I didn't call the cops that night. I still regret having not called despite my roommates insisting I do so. I just remember thinking that I wasn't sure what to say to the cops, that I hadn't really been attacked, that they wouldn't be able to find her anyway. I made up excuses. I suppose I must have been in shock and denial of having nearly been ambushed, especially by someone smaller than me, in my own city so close to my apartment. One of my roommates called the cops for me. A cop drove through the area, but by that point, she was gone. Woman with the little pink backpack. Let's not meet again.
This happened when I was four, so I don't remember all the minor details, but my mom does, and we kind of traced this whole thing when I suddenly got reminded of it because of reading a similar story. I'll try my best to explain and add the bits of my mom's memory as well. We used to live in a very rural area at that time and owned a small farm. Most people in the area had their own farmland, but the houses were located about five miles away from the area where all the farms were. It was the time when we had only one cell phone that my father used to keep with him at all times and no landline at our house. There was a public telephone booth two blocks down that a lot of people in the neighborhood used. It was around summer, I think. There was this group of gypsies, and they were notorious for stealing the crops and would also rob people occasionally, especially women working alone at the farm. My father had a regular job besides managing the farm, so he'd leave very early and would be back late at night. Normally, my mom would manage the farms by herself, but since the gypsies were going around robbing people... She stopped going there for a while, and I was also very young then. Most people in our neighborhood worked at their farms starting early in the mornings until evening, so our neighborhood was pretty desolated during daytime except a few people three or four blocks down to our house. Mom was very careful about locking the main doors and windows, so there wasn't much to worry about. My gramps from mom's side was visiting us one of these days, and he's like a very tall, big guy. I was playing at the dining table, my back facing the main entrance, and mom was in the kitchen, while gramps was inside the guest room, since he just arrived, maybe changing or freshening up. The thing was, mom forgot to lock the main entrance after gramps came in, and had no idea about it. I was facing my mom, telling her about whatever little me was doing, and she was facing the entrance. And I can clearly remember feeling terrified by the sudden change of expression on my mom's face. Now that I'm more aware of the wide range of emotions than a four-year-old I can tell it was a mixture of dread, shock, and just pure anxiety. She left whatever she was doing in an instant, and now she was standing between me and the entrance, shouting with a kitchen knife in her hand. And, as I peeked from behind her, there was a woman, and she had a sickle in her hand, inside our house. She was standing there trying to make a conversation, as if that was you know, normal. She definitely thought that we were the only people in the house. She was wearing lots of metal jewelry and stuff like that. You know, the gypsies all wore the same. Mom was telling me to run to Gramps, and I was crying, not wanting to leave her because I could probably sense the danger. It's only been like two minutes and my gramps come running and yelling from the room in the far back, telling the woman to get the fuck out of our house. And she was still trying to pretend and telling stuff like she just wanted some water and this is a pretty house, but now she was also backing away, more yelling and shouting from gramps and mom and the woman finally left. My mom locked the entrance, and now my gramps was trying to calm her down as she was shaking a lot. My mom told me later that the most scary part was she couldn't even notice the woman getting inside. I could have been seriously hurt or possibly taken hostage if she had not noticed a bit more late. And the woman didn't even flinch when it was just my mom shouting at her with a fucking kitchen knife in her hand. So, she was not scared of her at all, and was most probably looking for an opportunity to take her on. My mom has a small build, and that gypsy woman was tall, like much taller than my mom. No wonder she was prepared to take her chances.
Hello, my name is Christoph, and I'm a high school student in my first year, so I'm 16 years old. This story took place during the second week of Easter vacation in 2023 when I was 15 years old, and I want to mention that it happened in my mother's house. At that time, my mother had decided to renovate the kitchen because it was really outdated. So, there was this blonde guy with blue eyes who came to start the work, which involved putting up plastic sheets on the walls and a divider in my living room, which is next to the kitchen. At the end of the day, I had to go to the dentist to pick up a dental impression, and my mother had informed the worker that we would be back in an hour and 30 minutes. However, since the appointment was just to pick up an item, we returned only after 45 minutes. On the way back, my mother suggested getting kebabs and doing a good deed by dropping off the worker at the train station. When I returned to offer him a ride to the station, I noticed he was very uneasy with a nervous smile, as if to say everything was fine. I insisted that he come with us, and he agreed. Along the way, he explained that his name was Brian, I'm changing his name for anonymity, and that he was originally from Madova. He also mentioned that he lived alone in Paris but had two children living in his home country. We arrived at the station, dropped him off, grabbed our kebabs, and went home. After finishing eating, I decided to take a bath, as I loved doing that all the time. However, this time, to my dismay, the water turned from hot to cold. So I spent two hours in lukewarm water, then got out and returned to my upstairs room. Immediately upon opening the door, I noticed that my PC was open and turned on to my lock screen wallpaper, even though I distinctly remember closing it before going downstairs for my bath. I asked my mother if she had been in my room or touched my PC, and she said no, that she had stayed in her room watching the news. After a quick search of my room, turning up nothing, I decided to finally go to sleep. At 5 a.m., I woke up sweating and shivering intensely, which had never happened to me before. I had a feeling of danger that something or someone was nearby. So, I grabbed a knife because, yes, it's a bit scary, but I have a passion of edge weapons probably from Minga, and I have a collection of knives, katanas, and shurikens on my bedroom wall. With a knife, I searched my room again, but found nothing. However, the feeling didn't go away, so I locked my door and messaged my mother to see if she was awake and had the same feeling, but she didn't respond. I waited for three hours until I heard her walking in her room. She came to see me, and I explained what had happened that night. She told me I was probably just being paranoid and that everything was fine. She also warned me that Brian would arrive at about 10 a.m. and to continue the work, and that since she would be leaving for work, I would be alone with him. She assured me that I wouldn't need to go downstairs to let him in because she told him she kept the keys in the woodshed next to the door. She then went to work, and I went back to sleep, locking my door. I awoke at 11.30 a.m., went downstairs to make food in the basement because the kitchen was under construction, and when I didn't find Brian there, I didn't think much of it. I went back upstairs and I ran into him. As soon as I saw him, the bad feeling returned, but he started talking to me. I tried to end the conversation and quickly went back to my locked room. Ten minutes later, Brian knocked on my door, asking for help carrying something. I didn't respond because I really didn't want to see him again, but he started trying to open the door and began kicking it hard. So my first instinct was to grab a knife, lock myself in my bathroom, which is in my room, and call the police. 
I explained in a panic what was happening, and the woman on the line said she was sending two cop cars, which should be arriving in ten minutes. While waiting, Brian managed to enter my room and began breaking down the bathroom door. I told him I had called the police, that they would be arriving any moment, that I was armed with a knife and that I wouldn't hesitate to use it. Upon hearing this, he stopped banging on the door and left. The police arrived and caught Brian as he was trying to flee. My mother immediately came home, saw me and burst into tears, telling me she should have listened to me. A few days later, the police called to explain that Brian was wanted for kidnapping, identity theft, torture, and murder. I believe that bad feeling I had during that night was him returning and hiding outside my room in the house because he knew where the spare keys were hidden. But now he is in prison, and I hope never to see him again. Thank you so much for reading my story. It's amazing how our instincts can be useful, and I'm glad I was able to lock my door because previously I couldn't, as I didn't have a key. I also think my weird passion for knives because I don't know if Brian would have left if I hadn't mentioned it, and especially thank you to the police who arrived so quickly and caught him. Back in 2013, I lived in Providence, Rhode Island, and had moved there for a new job. It was me living there in a quaint and spacious townhome with my then four-year-old daughter. We were relatively new to the area and didn't know many people, but did become familiar with the kind older gentleman who lived next door. His name, for the purpose of this story, was Ben. We lived in a connected townhome, with our two units abutting each other. Our street was lined with beautiful floral trees and was quite nice, but Providence is weird in that the conditions of the houses and little neighborhoods can vary drastically street by street. We were near a few rough neighborhoods, but I felt relatively safe in my new home. I remember a few nights prior to this specific night. I saw a Facebook post with a safety tip to put your car keys next to your bedside. So, if anything ever happened, you can press the alarm and scare the intruder off. I've never been overly concerned about my safety and rarely took advantage of any tips I saw on Facebook, so I'm not sure how or why I suddenly decided to heed this advice. I was reading a book in bed with my light on in my second floor bedroom hours after putting my daughter to sleep when I heard a loud sound outside. I peered out the window to take a look and saw nothing. I had taken some melatonin that evening, turned off the light, and went to sleep. It was maybe an hour and a half later or so when I was suddenly woken up by what felt like almost an earthquake. The room shook and I heard a loud thud. Half awake, I gasped and set up wondering if it was my imagination or if I actually felt something and immediately ran to my daughter's room, thinking she had fallen off the bed or injured herself or something. As I swung the door wide open, there she was, sleeping soundly and sweetly. I was so confused. I heard another loud bang and then had this very eerie feeling that something was wrong, but I couldn't quite figure it out. I grabbed my car key fob and took it downstairs as I nervously inspected the first floor. I swore to myself if I heard one more sound, I would press that alarm just in case. But I didn't. It was silent after that. I returned to bed and took a while to fall asleep again, but soon shut my eyes. The next day went on like any other day when I noticed a friend of mine had repeatedly called me in the afternoon. I picked up my daughter from preschool and called my friend back. Did you hear? He said. Uh, no. Hear what? 
I answered. The news outlets were mobbing your street about an hour ago, and the news trucks were even in your driveway. I sat silent and confused. Three men broke into your neighbor's place last night. They tied him up at gunpoint and stole thousands of dollars worth of items and took off with his car. I immediately fell to my knees and began sobbing. I had heard it all happen. I almost pressed the button. I almost, but I didn't. I sobbed and felt completely unsafe. I asked a friend to come over for the night to stay with us, and it wasn't until the next day I got the chance to speak to Ben. Ben explained the whole story and told me the cops wanted to talk to me so I could share what I had heard and experienced. He said the men smashed the window in his basement and entered through there. That's the sound I heard right before bed. Apparently, the timeline suggested that they saw my light and me peering out the window and waited 30 minutes or so until my light was out to enter the premises. They didn't realize he was home, and since he had gone to bed early that night, it was suggested that they cased the place beforehand. He had been asleep when one of them was rummaging through his stuff upstairs in his bedroom, which was directly on the other side of my closets through a shared wall. The sounds and shakes I heard and felt were apparently the intruder knocking him down to the ground after realizing Ben was there and cupping his mouth to tell him if he made another sound, he would kill him. This is why I never heard another sound as I was investigating thereafter. After they tied him up, he remained tied up for over 12 hours and eventually broke free before calling the police. I cried again and apologized profusely to Ben and explained what I had heard, and he simply said that as he was tied up, all he could think about was that he was glad it didn't happen to me and my little girl. I really don't know what I would have done if my daughter and I had to experience that level of trauma firsthand. Ben seemed to be okay considering it all, but it took me so long to feel safe again and for the guilt to subside. They never caught the guys, and I ended up ordering a taser, which was legal, by the way, and some mace, and even for the first time in my life, considered getting a gun, but I decided against it. I have been fortunate to never experience anything close to that again, and certainly didn't want to. I'm glad Ben was ultimately okay, but next time I'll listen to my instinct. It's better to be safe than sorry. To the men who tied up and robbed my old neighbor, you better hope we never meet again. August in 2020, I had moved in with my aunt and uncle to an insanely small rural town in California. When I first moved there, a friend of mine had made it to a point to show me that someone could drive across the whole town within five minutes, and at the time, I didn't realize how important that fact would become to the safety of me and my loved ones. My best friend, Haley, and I she was 17 and I was 18 years old at that time, were hanging out at a park that was about a five to 10 minute walk from where I lived. And I say park because there were a few tables and benches and it was technically known as a town park. But in reality, it was more a small grass clearing surrounded by woods and a dirt trail near the bank of a river. I had started to frequent this place after moving, walking down to the benches and trail to smoke or sit by the water. I had never really noticed any suspicious characters before this, 
Even though I had been plenty warned about a couple creepers that were in the area known for bothering young girls. Haley and I had been smoking for a bit, unbothered in the clearing, when we decided to finish our trip with exploring a trail a bit and just taking in the scenery. We had been walking and talking for about five minutes when I started to get this tension in my shoulders. Like that feeling you get when you know someone is looking at you. I had looked behind us and there was a man on the trail with us. Granted, this path pressed right against the side wall of a gated community, so seeing people going on walks and jogging was fairly common. I told my friend of the man's presence, but she had written it off as me being anxious, but she had a good point. I tend to be a bit hyper-aware at times, but something about that man felt wrong in my gut. We kept walking, and I would periodically look back and keep tab on the dark-haired, middle-aged man walking about 50 feet right behind us. After not too long at all, the man started picking up his pace behind us. Calm, casual walking became more of a speed walk, and I turned around completely and started walking backwards to try and communicate to this man that I was completely aware of his presence. He had made towards the side of the trail, looking like he was going to walk through the brush down by the river, and I felt a bit stupid. I turned back around, walking forward again, when I looked back, just once more to be sure he was gone. But as I was looking behind us for the last time, I see the man in a full sprint coming back onto the trail straight for me and Haley. I grabbed her sleeve with one hand and ripped out my pocket knife with the other, and I can't remember what I had said to her, but we started sprinting down that trail as well. I had never gone very far down that path and I had no idea where it was going to take us but the man running after us was blocking our path back to the clearing and the road but we could hear his footsteps on the dirt getting closer and closer. I let go of Haley's sleeve so I could pull my phone out and call my uncle as we were running. I told him we were being followed on the trail at the park but I couldn't tell him exactly where on the trail because I had never been much further than the entrance, and I had no idea where it led to. My uncle told me to stay on the phone and be loud so he could find me. I let out the loudest, shrillest scream I could, and we kept running until we reached what was the clear end of the path. We ran up to an old metal fence surrounding trees and what looked like an old abandoned house or shed. We had also reached the back corner of the outer wall for the gated community, and in that split second, this seemed to be our best bet. I ripped us off the dirt path into some trees lining the cement wall and yelled at Haley to climb as fast as she could, pushing her from the bottom so she could use a tree and the ledge to clear the top of the wall. I tossed my pocket knife and my phone over, and I'm not even sure how I scaled the wall myself, but I scrambled up and over as fast and as physically as possible. I landed next to Haley, basically face first into a nearly trim patch of grass inside the gated community, scaring a poor man who seemed to just be outside walking his dog. I became really aware of how strange we probably seemed. Two teenagers panicking and yelling while holding a knife, but this man seemed to know we were in trouble. He came over to ask us what was happening and if we needed anything, and Haley started explaining our disruption to his calm neighborhood. While I got back on the phone with my uncle and told him we made it into the gated community. Not even a minute later, my uncle came barreling towards the end of the path, and we could hear him shouting to the man on the trail that he had a firearm and all the things he was going to do with it. The man with his dog led us to a little access gate a ways back on the wall and unlocked it for us so we could meet my uncle on the path. 
My uncle told us that he had drove his car through the park all the way up the trail entrance as fast as he could and started running for us, but he didn't see any man as he was going. He checked on us and I retold him what happened with more detail than I could have imagined in my initial panic. He escorted us back down the trail to the car, firearm in full sight at the ready, just in case the man on the trail decided to reveal himself. We didn't see him on our walk back, and I haven't returned to this place since then. But any time that I had left the house before, I eventually moved. I was constantly paranoid. I was being followed. We were never able to figure out who this man was, and I haven't seen him since that day. But to the man on that trail, you were very lucky that we escaped and you did not get to meet my uncle. And that, dear listeners, brings a close to these true creepy Let's Not Encounters. Before I go any further, I would like to give a very special shout out to the elite members of Back to Ashes. Chrissy Elias, Anita V, Donna, Les Crispin, Samantha Place, Call Me Carter, Corpse Lover, Stephanie McLaren, Denise S, Tina Mee, Tammy Slayton, Dova Khaleesi, Ida Smith, Amy Klimko, and Haunted. Again, thank you all so much for being the pillars that keeps this channel afloat. For without you all, I would have a mental breakdown. <laughs> I cannot show you enough appreciation. Thank you, thank you, thank you. To the other subscribers, for the first-time listeners, or for any random listeners that popped in, thank you so much for your support. For without you, I would not have a voice, and there would not be a back to ashes. If you are sleeping, I hope Slumberland is treating you comfortably. If you're awake, I hope you've enjoyed this collection. Until next time, please take care of yourselves. I'll be reading to you soon. You have yourselves a good morning, a good afternoon, or a good night. Peace, love, and light to you all.